Ladies and gentlemen, let me jump straight to the topic of the conversation, which is Professor Jeffrey Sachs epitomizes the spirit of precisely what we are talking about, the race to achieve these sustainable development goals and beyond in an environment where we are still trying to figure out from this global pandemic, which has challenged science, technology, and innovation, and yet at the same time brought science, technology, and innovation with the speed with which vaccines have been delivered, with the speed with which you know, uh, effective responses have been delivered, and the speed with which we have seen in China an effective public health response has been waged. So with that, I take the pleasure of welcoming Professor Jeffrey Sachs, the global SDG advocate for the United Nations, and a professor of a lovely university called Columbia. So Princeton may be even better, but I didn't want to say that. But over to you, Jeff. Sid, thank you very, very much. Well, let, let me proceed. Uh, you, Your Excellencies, uh, what a great honor it is for me to be speaking with you. Uh, President uh, Jin of AIIB, congratulations to you for your fantastic leadership, uh, uh, not only uh, starting, uh, but uh, achieving great breakthroughs of AIIB to make it one of the world's premier institutions. And uh, to the UN country team, how much I admire your work uh, and thank you for your work. And to all of the ambassadors, uh, let me uh, wish you uh, a, a very good evening and express my admiration to you and for our shared efforts uh, to achieve a, a decent world. Thank you for the chance to share a few thoughts with you this evening. I want to start by congratulating China on a year of remarkable accomplishments in a period of incredible difficulty. China uh, showed that COVID-19 can be brought under control decisively. Uh, after the initial outbreaks, China took strong and effective measures to prove what was not known at the time, and that is that the transmission of this new deadly virus would be contained through effective government measures combined with a very responsible public response, public behavior. And already a year ago, transmission of this virus in China was brought to near zero. I have spent the past year in the United States trying to uh, help my own country understand what China and its neighbors have accomplished. Uh, but unfortunately, in the U.S. and Europe and in other parts of the world, the epidemic continued to rage. Our public policies were very bad. Our public response was rather uh, irresponsible, I would say. And the results are stark. In China, the deaths from COVID have been kept to below 5,000. In the United States, the deaths have reached 550,000. So it is striking more than 100 times the deaths in the United States, though the population of the United States is less than one quarter of China, our death mortality, our mortality rate per capita has therefore been uh, more than uh, four times uh, 100, more than 400 times China's. So first, a congratulations to China on proving to us and helping us to understand what is needed to contain this virus. And fortunately, other countries, especially in the Asia-Pacific Asia region, have followed China's example. So the Asia-Pacific uh, has largely contained the pandemic, though my part of the world, the North Atlantic region, is still in deep crisis and indeed a renewed lockdown. But that's not all that China accomplished last year because China ended on schedule in the midst of this difficult year, extreme poverty. 
in a 40 year period, China went from a poverty rate of an estimated 80% in 1980 to zero in extreme poverty in 2020. This is one of the greatest achievements of economic development in history, perhaps the greatest. And it is an inspiration, I believe, to every part of the world that it is possible to end poverty, even on schedule, as China did, through concerted and effective and sustained efforts. I watched this with my own eyes, I can tell you. I first came to China in 1981. Uh, and so I have watched the transformation of China in the past two generations, coming every year at least one or two times, having the pleasure and honor to visit dozens of cities across all parts of China, visiting the poorest counties of China on several occasions, Ningxia uh, and other regions, and watching the end of poverty before my eyes. To uh, the African excellencies in the room, what China has accomplished in ending extreme poverty is, I believe, Africa's future in the coming generation, because Africa can make similarly enormous strides and is starting to do so. And I believe that this progress will accelerate dramatically. And I do believe that China shows a path for how uh, it is possible to make a profound transformation and with such benefit for well-being in such a short period of time. China also developed several effective vaccines during the past year and successfully launched the new 14th plan. It's all a remarkable set of accomplishments in a very, very difficult year. It leads me to the basic view that China can be and should be a decisive global leader in the sustainable development goals, not only for China's own accomplishment, but for the entire world to accomplish the sustainable development goals and the related objectives of the Paris Climate Agreement and the Convention on Biological diversity. So I'd like to speak for a few minutes about China's leadership in the coming years and how China can not only secure these bold objectives within China, and I'm very confident that that can be done, but also help the entire world to achieve the sustainable development goals. Sustainable development is the most important organizing principle that we have globally. It calls on us to aim simultaneously for three objectives, for economic well-being, for social inclusion and social justice, and for environmental sustainability. So we sometimes call it the triple bottom line, economic, social, and environmental objectives combined. These objectives are part of our globally agreed goals. The 17 Sustainable Development Goals adopted in September 2015, the goals for conserving biological diversity that is part of the Convention on Biological Diversity, and the goals adopted in December 2015 in the Paris Climate agreement. These are goals that have timelines to 2030 and to 2050. I know of no country in the world that does better on meeting timelines than China, setting clear milestones, dates, objectives, and achievements is China's specialty. And in this regard, I believe the Sustainable Development Goals and the Paris Climate Agreement are not only within reach for China and the world, but I am confident will be achieved in China and with China's leadership 
can be achieved in all parts of the world. Now, we have a major challenge because achieving these three objectives simultaneously is not straightforward. And we know from China's own experience that the dramatic successes of the period from 1980 to 2020 were accompanied by widening inequalities of income and wealth and also by worsening environmental conditions. So China achieved perhaps the greatest economic development in a short period of time for such a major part of the world uh, in 40 years. But I would not say that China achieved sustainable development during this period. China achieved remarkable economic development. But to achieve sustainable development is to achieve a more holistic kind of development that includes addressing the inequalities that accompany economic development and that have widened in China between urban and rural, between different parts of the country, between different households with different positions in society, as well as what are obviously the extraordinarily serious environmental challenges that China and the entire world faces. Widening Income inequality is characteristic of nearly the entire planet now because technological changes are enabling some groups and some regions to pull ahead of others and leaving some regions lagging and even some falling in absolute terms. The environmental crises, of course, are also global and of extraordinarily serious, indeed dire dimensions. We obviously face four major kinds of environmental crises that are addressed in the SDGs and the two UN conventions that I've mentioned. The first is human-induced climate change, which is at risk of reaching catastrophic proportions. 2020 was the warmest year on record, tied with 2016. We have already had planetary warming of 1.2 degrees Celsius. It's notable that 2020 was a La Nina year in the Pacific, meaning that it would normally have been a relatively cool year. So we can see that the warming is actually accelerating if we take note of the interannual changes in the Pacific. We are having temperature increases of 0.2 and 0.3 degrees Celsius per decade now. This could become catastrophic. The kind of sandstorms that hit uh, Beijing uh, and that hit Mongolia earlier this year, very devastating sandstorms, uh, are examples of the kind of effects of the drying and the warming conditions that are occurring worldwide. We know that in order to solve this crisis, we need to make fundamental changes in the energy system and in land use. We need to end deforestation, and we need to shift from carbon-based energy sources, coal, oil, and gas, to zero carbon energy sources, wind, solar, hydro, nuclear, and others. The second major environmental catastrophe underway is the loss of biodiversity, also experienced within China and globally. We are losing habitats all over the world, uh, in the oceans, in the fisheries, in the coastal regions, in the tropical rainforests, and our global supply chains are exacerbating these habitat losses. When China's huge demand for uh, tropical woods, uh, for soybeans, uh, for palm oil, uh, and other commodities hit the local conditions in 
Indonesia or Malaysia or Brazil, that contributes uh, to deforestation, uh, to the unsustainable spread uh, of new farmlands, to uh, the uh, loss of major biodiversity. So this is the topic of the Convention on Biological Diversity, where China will host in October COP15 in Kunming, a crucial challenge and a crucial topic for the world. The third environmental crisis, of course, is pollution. And we see the massive effects of pollution on human health and well-being in China with the still uh, pervasive air pollution, with the water pollution, the coastal pollution, the soil pollution, uh, and the uh, plastics pollutions uh, in our oceans. And this challenge is also uh, still running out of control. And the fourth environmental crisis that we face is the increasing frequency of the zoonotic diseases like COVID-19. These are diseases, as we know, like SARS, like MERS, uh, like uh, Nipah virus, that spread from animal populations to human populations, probably in the case of uh, COVID-19 from horseshoe bats, perhaps originating in uh, Yunnan uh, or in Southwest China, nobody knows for sure, but quickly spread through human populations to the world. And we are seeing more and more of these zoonotic events. We have had several emerging diseases in the 21st century, and they are coming more frequently because we are disturbing nature more intensively. And in Africa, of course, uh, the repeated outbreaks of Ebola virus are probably the result of disturbances uh, with fruit bats uh, that uh, also are the reservoir, we think, uh, of Ebola. So, Your Excellencies, the agenda is enormous to keep inequalities restrained, to ensure that no one is left behind, and to attend to the manifold environmental crises that have resulted from a world economy that has now reached well over $100 trillion a year. And so with this scale of production and environmental threat, uh, and with the inequalities that result from rapid technological change, we have our work cut out for us. We need a new kind of development strategy, one that is more holistic, uh, one that is goal-based, one that is taking into account long-term objectives. Again, I can't think of a, another country other than China that is better equipped to address this kind of holistic challenge. China's development capacity, its planning capacity, its ability to look forward and to think ahead for many years, its ability to deploy new technologies is remarkable, in some ways unique, uh, though I think perhaps shared only by your near neighborhood. Uh, I hope that the United States can regain some of this capacity to look ahead, to plan ahead, to think ahead, but we lost it, uh, at least uh, temporarily. And we need the combination of the planning capacity and the market forces as China is deploying in order to meet the challenges of sustainable development. Let me say that for China's own uh, development uh, challenge, the direction adopted in the 14th plan, I think is on track and very important. Uh, China's development continues to be based on advances of technology and developing new and powerful technology to meet our needs whether those are the needs of renewable energy or uh, zero carbon transport with the advances in transport in 
automobiles with electric vehicles, aviation, ocean shipping, more uh, effective and targeted advanced agriculture with precision agriculture that is less polluting and more productive, with advances in healthcare, with deployments of advanced digital technologies. All of this is on the right course. What I would hope and ask for is that China take specifically the Sustainable Development Goals to 2030, provide the metrics, and orient the national policies to ensure that all of the SDGs are achieved by 2030. Again, I know of no other country that can set the timelines, set the dates, and then make uh, coherent the national policies, the public investments, and the regulatory environment for business to enable such complex objectives to be achieved. For China's well-being and future development, the shift to renewable energy, to zero carbon energy, and to achieve net zero greenhouse gas emissions is obviously essential. President Xi Jinping's commitment last uh, September at the UN that China would reach net zero greenhouse gas emissions no later than 2060, is a global breakthrough. Uh, it aligns with the commitments of Europe in the European Green Deal to reach zero by 2050, uh, with the commitments by Japan and Korea to reach zero by 2050, with the commitments of the United Kingdom to reach zero by 2050, and now with the commitments of President Biden in the new U.S. administration to reach zero by 2050. My only request in this regard to China is that achieving zero by 20 before 2060 uh, should be achieving uh, zero no later than 2050. Uh, that is a tight timeline, but again, <laughs> there's no country that can do it faster and more comprehensively than China. Uh, China has every technology needed. Uh, it is the low-cost producer of photovoltaics. It is the world's low-cost producer of uh, large-scale wind power. It is the world's low-cost producer of large-scale hydropower. Uh, it is uh, an effective uh, nuclear energy uh, country. Uh, it is the expert in long-distance uh, high voltage direct current transmission of power, which as the China state grid has shown is essential for creating a zero carbon energy system. China will be leader in electric vehicles. Uh, China will be leader uh, among others in 5G technologies. All of this means that achieving zero by 2050 is not only necessary for the world, but is achievable within uh, China's uh, capacities and technological uh, structure and would be of huge advantage, in my view, for China's uh, global reach uh, and uh, global constructive role, as well as its exports of zero carbon high technologies uh, in the future. So my one uh, plea and request is that China advance the date to reach zero uh, to mid-century uh, and spur all of the rest of the world to take on this objective as well. Let me say a few more words uh, in closing about China's international role, which obviously is of crucial importance for global well-being. In my view, China has a decisively important and positive role to play on the international stage in the years ahead, because as a world leader in these key technologies, as, as the world's uh, most dynamic uh, large economy, 
and is one that can help to provide solutions to so many parts of the world and partnership to so many parts of the world. China's leadership in sustainable development will be essential. As uh, my friends uh, and uh, your excellencies know, I, I have been an enormous uh, fan and supporter of the Belt and Road Initiative since its inception. Uh, I believe that the Belt and Road Initiative is uh, a smart, forward-looking uh, program to build 21st century infrastructure across Eurasia and across the Indian Ocean region and in partnership with Africa and in Latin America. So I have been an enormous uh, fan and supporter of the initiative. I have always believed that the Belt and Road Initiative should be the uh, decisive infrastructure program for sustainability as well. So I have emphasized also how the Belt and Road Initiative should be the green Belt and Road Initiative, uh, that there should be no uh, more fossil fuel investment in the Belt and Road Initiative, but that it should focus uh, on areas uh, of Chinese uh, great technological strength, uh, photovoltaics, uh, solar, uh, uh, wind power, uh, 5G technologies, uh, electric, uh, fast intercity rail, uh, introduction of electric vehicles, and all of the other uh, technological mix that will be central for decarbonization. I'm very happy to see the leadership of China in making clear in recent months that the Belt and Road Initiative indeed will be the Green Belt and Road Initiative. I want to commend President Jin uh, of leading the AIIB to such clear standards on not financing coal projects, uh, on championing the sustainable development agenda. And I believe that a Green Belt and Road program will be a decisive advance for achieving the Paris Climate Agreement and the other environmental objectives. China has many such opportunities for global leadership in sustainable development. In order for any country to reach net zero emissions, there needs to be close cooperation with neighbors. This is a basic principle that I would like to uh, uh, underscore. For China or any other country in the Asia Pacific region, Japan, Korea, Australia, the ASEAN countries, to achieve net zero emissions and a green uh, energy system by mid-century requires regional cooperation that is strong because with intermittent zero carbon energy sources like wind and solar, they must be interconnected. So China, Japan, Korea, Mongolia, ASEAN should be interconnected in a large regional grid, a large regional power market, a large market for hydrogen, green hydrogen produced with green power as well, uh, as uh, is already taking shape. And this is an area where China's diplomatic leadership, as well as its financial and technical leadership, can play an enormous role. In addition to being a big fan of the Belt and Road Initiative, I am also a big fan of RCEP, of the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership. Uh, the 15 countries, including China, Japan, Korea, the 10 ASEAN countries, Australia, and New Zealand. This is a powerful regional group. It is one quarter of the world's population, one quarter uh, of the world's uh, GDP, one quarter of the world's trade, and by cooperating together, a very, very powerful force for advancing 
green technologies and the success of the Asia-Pacific region in helping to lead the world in sustainable development. So I would like to emphasize how important it is for China to promote cooperation with all of the neighbors, Japan, Korea, Australia, New Zealand, uh, in this shared effort. Let me say a word about uh, Africa and uh, China in this regard, if I may. Africa, I believe, is at the cusp of very rapid sustainable development. Uh, Africa's economic growth currently, not in uh, the COVID shock year, but in uh, normal years, uh, runs at four, perhaps 5%. But Africa can and should emulate China by aiming for economic growth of at least 7% per year, which is consistent with a doubling per decade of output, and I think could reach up to 9 to 10% per year. In order for that to occur, Africa needs to think like China. Uh, it needs to be unified. It needs to have strong African Union leadership. Uh, it needs a unified market internally, which Africa is now proceeding on very rapidly. And most importantly, uh, together with all of that, it needs massive investment, just as China has shown. Massive investment in three areas. Uh, the first, uh, in infrastructure, in electrification, in 5G, uh, in uh, transport, water and sanitation, uh, and rapid urbanization. Second, it needs massive investment in education, another area where China has shown uh, how to develop a uh, world-leading uh, primary and secondary education in some of the world's great universities uh, in a relatively short period of time. And third, Africa, of course, needs business investment and will have many opportunities for attracting major investment from all over the world in digital technologies, in agriculture, in mining, in manufacturing, uh, in many service sectors as well. So I believe that the next generation should be the generation of mega investment in Africa. Uh, in the infrastructure, in the people, especially the children of Africa, and in the business development. And in this regard, the close economic relations of China and Africa will be key and hugely beneficial for both sides. China brings know-how, the experience of rapid economic growth, capacities for deep planning, capacities for rapid infrastructure development, and of course, the world's low cost infrastructure uh, programming itself. And of course, Africa brings a young, eager generation of young people who are gaining skills and who are eager for more skills and for advancement. And I think the combination of the two makes possible a breakthrough that uh, the world still doesn't expect, but I think will amaze the world in the coming generation. Africa, in terms of infrastructure, especially needs electrification and digital technology, both areas of enormous strength of China. Uh, and when one combines the innovative financing of AIIB and other Chinese institutions, China's technology uh, and Africa's determination to make a breakthrough. I believe that there is a very bright prospect for China scale breakthroughs in Africa's economic development in the years ahead. Let me close by discussing one crucial point. It, with all that I've said, the world remains uh, in a very precarious situation right now. Uh, I've uh, perhaps sounded uh, 
uh, perversely uh, optimistic or unusually optimistic in a world that faces two major kinds of challenges. First, we are still battling with the COVID-19, though the Asia-Pacific region has largely brought it under control. The rest of the world certainly has not yet brought it under control. Uh, We are battling uh, similarly with the fallout every week, every month with new climate shocks and other disruptions. That's on the one side, the natural environment and the disruptions. And on the other side are the geopolitical tensions. And sadly, the geopolitical tensions between the United States and China, which I believe have absolutely no useful purpose and which we need to overcome. For both of these facts today, the facts of instability because of the pandemic and because of environmental crisis and the instability of uh, global geopolitics, the solution is more cooperation. The solution is showing that the gains that we uh, achieve by working together profoundly outbalance anything that could be achieved by tension, conflict, or dissension. What I would ask of China and suggest of China is that China's most important contribution, therefore, uh, in the coming year and in the years ahead is its championship of global cooperation which it has been doing and which I believe it needs to reemphasize at every point. China is a great defender of the United Nations system and a great defender of multilateralism. And this is precisely what we need today. So I look forward to China not only working with the wonderful UN country team in China, but giving global support to the UN system and the multilateral system, and emphasizing to everyone in the world, whatever provocation may come, and there have been provocations, unfortunately, from the US and from others, that China is not interested in conflict. China is not interested in division. China is interested in global cooperation for the common good. If we can secure that, I'm sure that we can solve all of our problems together. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for the chance to be with you today.